Welcome to the two o'clock first lecture of the season. I'm Brian Connery. Uh, I was a docent here. I'm a docent at the Red Barn over in San Andreas. I'm a blacksis. I'm a woodworker, blacksis, blacksmith. Sorry, it's been a busy day. And it is an honor to come up here and speak with you folks, describe something perhaps you've never seen before, <coughs> describe something you've never done before, or perhaps something that you have. So um, it's, um, it's a hobby. I don't have to do this. Uh, woodworking is something that you should enjoy. It's a lot of hard work if you don't. And uh, it depends on what you're working, what you're doing. Is it a toy for the grandkids? Is it an armor for your uh, mother-in-law? Is it, you know, something, I mean, you can come up with, you know, some possibility. So it depends on what you're doing it for. I do it for fun. I do it to learn. You make something, you put it aside, or you keep it as a door prize for your first lecture of the season. <laughs> it's, oh, did I give that away? Oh, darn. So there will be a door prize. So um, I've been doing this for about 50 years, off and on, the metalwork and the woodwork. Usually they join together. You know, if you do just one, just the metalwork, say, it can get kind of boring after a while because how do you improve on something that, uh, that um, doesn't glue together very well, will cut you very badly, and takes a lot of hard work and high heat to be able to manipulate it. Wood is different. Wood is as plain and as mellow as this piece of two by four pine, or as difficult as this piece of Argentinian lignum vita, which is one of the hardest woods in the world, okay? But there's a story along with that piece is my girlfriend's son-in-law has Alzheimer's, dementia, going deaf, stomach cancer, all kinds of problems. And one day down in Brentwood where I live, and where he lives nearby, we went to the local park and he wandered off. Couldn't find him for eight hours. He had walked four miles away on a walkabout, like an Australian walkabout. He just says, big deal, I went for a walk four miles away. So halfway through that experience, one of the cops that was working the case said, do you happen to work in wood? Well, duh, you know, who doesn't? But would you want some hardwood? Well, duh, who doesn't? But it's expensive hardwood. Well, I don't know if I want to. You know? He says, but this will be for free. I'm trying to give it away. My dad worked on this stuff. It's in the garage. It's gathering dust. It's gathering bugs. And I'm trying to get rid of it. So he says, do you want some? Oh, OK, bring some. So 15 minutes later, he comes back with half of a tree trunk, yay size, of this stuff worth $500. OK? It's at least 60 years old because the dad had been working on it for 30 years. It's been 30 years since he passed away. So it's at least 60 years old or more. So it's very well cured. It works beautifully, polishes itself when you work it, glues really nicely. Is it metal frame? See for yourself. It's very heavy. So, so it's, it's, it's interesting stuff. It, planes nicely, it chisels nicely, it's a little on the brittle side, and it has a story, a story that goes along with it. What is the story on the lady? Oh, you're good. <laughs> it turns like soap, like you're cutting a piece of soap, because it has a natural wax that's part of the, the cellular structure of the wood, the natural wax that's in there, it's a preservative for itself. They even use it as bearings on propeller shafts and submarines because it's self-lubricating. So it has a wax in there. So when you turn it with chisels, it just, it goes this fast. Boom, 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 boom. But it polishes itself when you work it. And it's pretty amazing stuff. So saving $500 and you get a giant chunk and it's like, here you go. But there's a catch. The reason I do traditional woodworking is because technically, and, and I had to admit it, I can't afford the power tools that would cut it easily, grind it easily, shape it easily, sand it easily. So it has to be done by hand. So 
in theory, traditional woodworking was done by hand, but you're talking about pre-industrial woodworkers. You're talking about, say, pioneer folks. You're talking about artisans back 300, 400 years ago before there was machinery which would cut it easily, sand it easily, grind it easily, process it easily, machine it easily. It's got to be done by hand. So that's why a lot of these tools here are handmade because, in my opinion, a handmade object requires handmade tools. You don't have to, but if it's a hobby, yes, you can. It makes it really easy. Any questions yet? Nothing yet? So where do you start? How far back do you go when you say traditional woodworking? 10,000 years? 1,000 years? Yesterday? You know, what's, what's traditional? Uh, a text I read recently said, it's traditional if you like doing it without power tools. Okay, because the power tool machines your wood as if it was an industrial project that needs to have a lathe that will create a hundred of the same thing with absolute precision, with absolute uh, uh, micrometer readings, so it's exactly the same as the next one. But what if you're the person that does things that are unique, that are one of a kind, that you don't have to have perfect micrometer reading to make it perfect? What if it's good enough? What if it makes you happy? So. Some of these projects, like say, um, a tool that needs to have an adjusting ability to adjust the plane iron on a simple Chinese plane, you need to be able to, there you go. So the African blackwood is really hard end grain. So it takes getting beaten up this way, beaten up that way. You only have to resand it once every year, two years, something like that. But you need to be able to, isn't that nice grainy? Yeah. You see that? Yeah. That's ebony right there. So you need to be able to understand how in the olden days, pre-industrial times, the wood that they had was limited by the quantity that they had able to get a hold of. Way back 10,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago, you look at those Venus de Milo stone figures that the ancient folks would make, and it was kind of the shape of a rock because that's how the rock was shaped. They're able to chip away just a little bit, and it kind of looked like the, what they wanted because that's all they could get. You know, nowadays you can get is the quantity that you want in board feet. You know? But if you're doing things by hand, old traditional style, you have to be able to saw those boards to shape and to size, and it takes a long time. Now, even if you have giant size rip saws, it still takes a while for you to be able to transform a board into something that's usable stock, okay? All these things here, just pieces of stock. So if you have a project in mind, you go, I need a piece of cocobolo that's about a quarter of an inch thick. Well, looky, looky here, there it is, you know? You need to have something that is a veneer of redwood, stabilized redwood veneer, one sixteenth of an inch thick. There it is. This is part of a collection that a, a fellow um, assessor woodworker, no, well, he wasn't a woodworker, a uh, co-worker, Fresno County Assessor said, my grandpa had a whole bunch of these little pieces of veneer, a stack of about 100, all different kinds of woods from all different parts of the world, do you want it? Well, duh. <laughs> I mean, you look at things like stabilized redwood burl. What am I going to do with that? That's, it gets tricky, but that's why it's the bigger pieces, the big pieces of walnut, the bigger pieces of curly maple. Never could quite figure out what to do with this. Um, and then you start getting distracted and you say, well, okay, but what about, what about the tools, the hand tools that are gonna work these pieces of wood so that it's made by you, you've learned from it, you've challenged yourself, you've overcome the challenge or whatever it is that was causing you problems, okay? What, what do you do? So what you do is you, you challenge yourself to do something that's impossible, 
which is to make a actual usable hand tool made by hand, but with a challenge. And the challenge is, can you take pure iron rod, pure as, as can be, about the size of a pencil, about a foot long, and can you twist it? Can you flatten it? Can you shape it with a tang? Can you make a broad end down here and then take a piece of a file? And can you forge weld it, just the one piece right here, so you see the texture of the twisted iron? It has character, okay? That's always important in the tool that I try to make is they have character, something that puts them one step beyond just something you can get at Kmart. I doubt you can get this at Kmart. I really do doubt you can get it at Kmart. And the fun part was I kind of decided this is going to be the, the no, I won't say door price. Anyways, um, anybody guess what this is for? <laughs> it's a mallet, okay? And anybody guess what it's made of? Exactly. Does it really matter what it's made of? Yes, it does. If it was a piece of pine wood, this lowly, simple, poor, but found everywhere kind of wood, you find it everywhere. So you get it for 250 over there at the local Ace Hardware, say. But do you get a piece of oak that you can turn that turns itself into a mallet, which gives you the ability to shape your lowly piece of pine wood? So you turn it. It does not turn like soap, I can tell you that. Um, any questions yet? Nothing yet? We'll wait till the customers walk on past. Um, the tools to work with come in various forms. This is what's called an all AWL. It's made for making little points. If you want to start a screw in something, it helps that you have a hole already there, especially in hardwoods like, I don't know, ePay. You've heard of ePay, I'm sure, before? Yeah, yeah. That looks uh, like it started life as a two plus two hole. That's exactly what it was. How do you, how do you know these things? <laughs> so yes, it was a button hook, and I saw the potential put to it, and I said, you know, it just needs to be straightened out and pointed. The ivory on the handle, it makes it look kind of frou-frou. Hey. If it works, who cares, right? That was a good one. That was good. Now, can anybody guess what this is? It's all that spoke shape. Okay, it's a spoke shape. Now, can anybody guess how old it is? Well, a dog chewed the end of it, so it's, good, it's kind of beat up. But uh, I'd guess it's between 150 and 200 years old, something like that. Now, for the local folks here, you can probably guess where I got it from, locally. Jamestown. Oh, it's a spoke shave. They're able to shave thin strips, okay? Uh, it's similar to this also handmade tool. You get thin sh shavings from it. This is not adjustable. This is very adjustable for the thickness of the shavings. So over there at the, uh, one of the flea market setups over there in Jamestown, I walked past a little bucket and said, for two bucks, do you want this? Sure, 200 year old antique. That's been chewed on by a dog, but still works very nicely, yeah. So the tools out there to work wood, the wood to be worked by tools are both out there. You just have to look for them. You have to have a reason to look for them. Do you want to be challenged by what you do? Or do you want to do it the easy way? You know, a little piece of pine wood, stick a nail in it, that's good enough. No, it's not. It is not good enough. That's the reason for this spoke shave. It's, it's a laminated uh, iron on one side, steel on the other, with ePay handles. It was just a challenge. Guess what was on a, uh, a English YouTube channel video the other night? Was somebody using a manufactured version of one of these? Nicely turned handle, blade looks the same. It's like, 
But this has character. That one is machined in, an, in a factory. It just doesn't have character. It has utility, but it doesn't have character. It doesn't have a story behind it. Okay. <sighs> Give me a second there. Could you keep track of my time? All right, I can w probably look at my watch and do the same thing. Okay. So everything's going so far? Nobody's falling asleep or you know, getting bored? OK. Um, along with the tools, you need to have the ability to sharpen the tools. You can use tools against hardwood, and it will blunt your edge just like that. So how do you sharpen it so it becomes razor sharp again so you can just make thin little shavings? You have to use a series of in this case, water stones, not oil stones. Oil stones take that stuff that's ground off the blade and it gets into the grain of the, the stone and it gets clogged up and the oil turns cold and gets gummy. It's really nasty. So these are all water stones, different grits, different uh, finenesses of the stone. Okay, you start with a heavy grit first to shape it and a finer grip next to polish it and the finest grip, uh, grip grit at the end to put an edge on it, just that perfect razor edge. So here's the question. Why is it curved on the end? Any, any ideas? It'll probably tell you where it came from. Yes. No. I, uh, you've seen in uh, Western movies where, say, uh, one of the craftsmen is using this kind of action in the stone is turning in front of them and the water dripping on it. So that is part of that stone. I used one earlier this morning to put an edge on one of my tools. You just sit there and you just work on it. You drop the water like this. That's essentially grindstone stone, OK? This thing right here on the opposite end is like talcum powder. It's about. I'd guess between seven and 10,000 grit, something like that. It's just, it's like talcum powder. But it puts, after a while, a really good polish on whatever tool you have, as long as it's hard steel. Hard steel <coughs> polishes nicely. Softer iron kind of smears. It doesn't really polish it, more like it smears, you know? And it's not all chisels. It's not all saws. It's often a simple rasp or a simple rat tail file. Handmade handle, go to the department of Ace Hardware and get a little piece of copper, and you put it together, and this is a functional rasp, okay? You're able to sh shape your wood very quickly and very easily. Question, what's this? Square. Yes. Why do they call it a square? Because it's square. Also. Exactly, because it's square. square. Okay. So all the holes in it, that's a really that's a really good question. Uh, lightness. Maybe lightness, you know? You take away some of the metal, it makes it lighter. Do they line up with the inches? Makes it marker. Marker. It lines up with the inches. There you go. And the half inch and quarter inch. Yeah. Never noticed that. <laughs> I just looked at the wood and the shininess of the metal, and that's it. So when you put your pencil in there, okay, it draws a straight line. That's good. That's good. That's good. So what's the difference between these two? Any idea? Okay, this is actually a finishing plane. This is probably more like, um, yeah, it's like a roughing plane. Uh, any other ideas? What the difference is? Metal, one's wood. Okay, so one's metal, one's wood. Uh, if you had a choice, if you had a choice, if you had a choice. Uh, I'd like to make a comment. I see you have your plane resting on the side. Why? Well, you're protecting the display. Yes. My dad taught me that when I was just a little boy. And I teach so many woodworking programs that they don't do that. They have to. Questions? No, because they should. 
Yeah, just to protect the edge, because right now, uh, on this guy here, I spent a long time getting it so that it's just right, and it, it's hanging out just a little bit. You can look down at it and go, yep, there it is, along with a piece of wood that's hung in there. But I spent a long time polishing it. You don't want to sit there and bang on something hard. There goes the edge, and you got to start all over again. He says he's seen so many uh, woodworking shows where they have them flat, not on edge. And his dad taught him always have it on edge, never on the flat. Yeah. <laughs> so this is this is um, it's called Makassar. Makassar ebony is a combination of lighter and darker ebony colors. Mm -hmm. Okay. You can have some ebonies which are. Totally black. It doesn't have character. It just it just doesn't show what it's made of. Okay. Um, purple heart. That was pretty obvious to tell because it's a purple color. No? Uh, let's see. So uh, next, you have to think if you're making a project out of wood and going to do it traditionally, which means no power tools, none. You're it. You're the power. You're the tool holder. Okay. What's the figure of the wood? Does it have a lot of straight grain? Does the grain go in one direction so you know that you're supposed to plane the opposite direction? It doesn't grab the grain of the wood when you plane it, if you always know that. But what if the grain does this? What do you do then? Yeah. <laughs> Besides, throw it away. Yeah. You just take it easy. You just take it easy with a real sharp tool. You set the edge back almost till you can barely feel it, and just take your time. Because you know, the difference between woodworking that's done by hand and one that's done by machine is the machine assumes that what you're working on is something that needs machining, like a piece of metal, like an industrial age project. Okay, but what if it's something that has character, that has waviness? For goodness sake, that has a burl texture to it. How do you finish that by hand? One of the solutions is one of these. Any ideas besides the folks that know what this is? Any ideas what it might be? Okay, this is what's called a scraper. And a scraper is something where you can take this blade and you can back it out just a little bit till you barely feel it. And with these two adjusting screws, you can bow the scraper blade to make a heavy cut or a light cut, okay? But that's how you would finish a piece of burl wood, is you take a scraper, figure out where most of the grain is going to, and go with that grain diagonally. So you just barely scrape it. The piece of lignum, when it's finished and it's been planed and it's been polished, has a little glue sticking out of it, the scraper will just take it off just easy as can be and also polish it at the same time. Can a power sander do that? No, it can't. I should know because I have a power sander. Just the only thing I have is a belt sander. It makes things flat. Making things flat is really tough, you know? If you want to have two matching pieces of really exotic wood and then they have to be perfectly flat, planing it is the hardest way to do it. It's impossible to make it absolutely flat. So that's the only concession to non-traditional woodworking technique is just the belt sander, about that big. So um, we found that if you have wood with figure, with grain, how to work it. What if, say, you're given a project by, say, oh, I don't know, Jim Miller down there in the, the mining building, and he says, OK, this is how you make dovetail joints. You should be able to do this. It's easy, right? You know how long it took to make these? About six months. And then you go, wow, this boy, if I get this wrong, he's going to kill me. You know, it's, <laughs> oh, 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 what do I, oh, well, maybe I should start over again. So he did something like this, made a project into a box. <coughs> All these pieces of wood, probably in about two weeks, you know, in six months, I did this. So, <laughs> We have a different way of doing something that needs a little precision. You know, when it's one of a kind, you don't have to be precise. When it's unique, 
your only restrictions are of how you want it to look. No one is telling you. No one expects it. No one takes that micrometer and measures it. Oh, it's off a little bit, you know. If you ever get that comment, oh, you missed a spot, or that's wrong. It really gets on your nerves because <laughs> you, you wanted it to be that way. That's the way it's supposed to be. I like your way of thinking. <laughs> the more imperfections, the better it is, right? Because it's obviously handmade. So the tool that I finished hardening this morning has little imperfections here and there. It's just be a simple carpenter's chisel. But it has, what's the, what's the favorite word we want to use today? It has character. There are bits of hard steel mixed in with the iron, which when you harden it, takes a different color. When you polish it, it really stands out. And you know you've made something that never existed before, and here it is with imperfections. Now, when someone points those imperfections out, I think they're trying to get your goat. They're trying to you know, see how, how much you can take before you just go, go away. I don't want to talk with you anymore. Uh, one of the tools that woodworkers use to start their wood is one of these. That was handmade in Reno by 20 year, two 20 year olds. It's yeah, very yeah. sharp. Yeah. It's very sharp. So please be careful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's very sharp. But that was handmade. You actually watched the process, it videoed the whole thing, took pictures of the whole thing, take a block of steel and stretch it open. Put a, a, a bit of hard iron in between. Be careful, it's, it's, <laughs> it's really sharp. And actually shaped it, and he actually made the handle, and he says that'll be. That's more a Norse axe. It's what's called a bearded axe, yeah. a Scandinavian bearded axe. Mm. Okay, I'll get it, I'll get it. <laughs> um, what's our favorite word today? Yeah. It has yeah. character. Yeah. Whatever they needed, you know, either chop down their neighbor or chop down the wood. It has multi, multiple purposes. Thank you. A little bit more easily done is just go to the store and get one of these. Okay, but it doesn't have. Exactly. This wool was banged up and rusty and bent over there at Red Barn over there in San Andreas without a handle, and you say, you know, I think it needs TLC. <laughs> TLC, exactly. So polishing it, again, on the belt center, because it's hard to do by hand, it takes forever, and put a new edge on it, uh, rehandle it with the wood that the cop also gave me a board of. It's called Z Ricote. It's almost as hard as ebony, but it's, it's kind of boring. It's dark with dark lines on a dark background. Uh, cops and Brentwood. <laughs> I had to say it. I'm sorry. Um, so <laughs> that was too easy. Uh, so anyways, uh, where was I? Oh, yes. Yeah, so talking about woods, talking about tools. Uh, this also is borrowed from Red Barn. The reason it was donated, I'm not sure why it was donated. It's a Japanese um, log cutting saw. It goes cross cut and also rip saw, one side or the other, because it was busted. They, when they worked it, these are designs that you, you pull. They didn't know that, and they thought you had to push, and it bent it, and it cracked the piece right here, but since you're still pulling it and not bending it again, it's not going to break in half. So polish so it up. Is it a two-line piece or is it all set? Um, one or the other. You have one side is one and one side is the other. It depends upon if you're going across the wood or with the wood. You decide. You know? But it's so useful. It's like, why not fix it up and have it as a demonstration of what different kinds of hand saws that are out there.
You don't. It's, it, it's what's called impulse harden. They harden just the teeth themselves in the factory that makes it. So it stays hard for a long time. If you're a, a dummy and you think that you're supposed to push it, you'll break it. As the guy did, he cracked it. So usually you, you take it easy on what, what you got. You know, the other saws, also it's very flexible, okay? I found that by using this, it doesn't keep a straight line when you cut. It has a tendency of wandering. So its teeth are in really good shape because I really don't use it. The one that has a rigid back is very well used because it, it does a straight line and it's a beautiful cut. It's a real fine cut. And uh, yeah, this one, not so much. It's like a miniature version of that big boy. Yeah, it's rattan, yeah. Mm. And so when they made these, they just shoved the tang inside the handle. Yeah. But I noticed that when you're working on it, the tendency of pulling out. Oh. So I drilled through it and put a screw in there so it'll never pull out. Mm -hmm. So one of the fun part about, what's the fun part? One of the fun part is taking a manufactured tool. Now we all know what these are. <coughs> Draw a knife. And how are they used? Draw towards you. Um, one side is beveled, the other side is flat. Any idea why that would be? When, when you see the wood up, when right, when the wood. Flat. That's exactly it. Okay. Here's the flat side. You're doing a flat cut. You're trying to maybe take off knots or something like that. So you'd slice them off this way. If you wanted to dig into the wood, it dives in but you can control how much of a dive you're gonna have in there, okay? Notice I'm being very careful with it. Again, it's, and I'm not passing it around this time. <laughs> this is razor sharp. It is razor sharp, so not this time. It was, it's fun to have different versions of these things. I mean, here's, here's the little blade inside. Just an itty bitty little blade. Has two tangs that the screw adjusts the height of the blade, okay? But then you look at it and you go, this is really old. Wow, it doesn't even have a maker's mark saying, I made this, 1876 or whatever it is. And so that's kind of a proof that it was just made by somebody to say, you know, I need to have a tool that works for me. And so here it is, I'm not gonna put my name on it because who cares, who's gonna know in the first place? Like a pioneer guy, middle of nowhere, he's gonna recycle this from say, a file, okay? So why put your maker's mark on something that no one's ever going to see? Yeah. But your dog might eat it. That's true. <laughs> a wolf? Uh, yes, absolutely. I'm sure it was. Um, it makes a better story. It gives it character. Yeah. Um, a fun tool to make is a paring chisel. So the differences between, say, one that you can really whack on it, there's another paring chisel. They're really narrow, they're really fine. If you use it as a pry bar, you'll break it, okay? But using an old technique, it's called differential tempering. You actually put in just the hardest part of the edge is maybe a quarter of an inch. That's all you need is a quarter of an inch. That'll last you for the next 50 years. So at 70 plus 50, it's 100, I'll be 120 years. I won't care what condition it'll be then, <laughs> you know. But in the meantime, it's fun to be able to say, I made this, you know. You just flatten a bar out, a piece of spring steel from a coil, you know, give an edge to it. And if you never use it, it'll last longer. <laughs> I've noticed this, you know. That's the tricky part with making these fancy ones is, are you creating a tool for woodworking or are you making a jewel that you'll never use? Mm. You don't want to bang it up. You don't want to break it. You, want to make it. you don't want to make it unshiny. You don't want to get it covered with glue and sap and pitch and scratches and chips and whatnot. So that's the tricky part is are you making a tool or making a jewel? Depends on the wood that you're working and whether or not the person that you give it to for a door prize will appreciate it more 
if it's in perfect condition than if it's banged up. So that makes it easier to decide which one of these. Anyway, never mind. So um, <laughs> moving on to uh, a drink of water to ease my throat for a second. Yeah, of course. What category would you put a pole lathe in? A pole lathe? You like the one they have down there in the next building over? Okay, that's a treadle lathe. Okay, so it's a treadle lathe. It's only worked by foot. In fact, I don't know if you folks had time for this or not after the lecture is over with in 20 minutes, is the mining museum has the carpentry shop and it has probably 100 different pre-industrial and industrial age tools, woodworking tools, which will blow your socks off. This is just a drop in the bucket compared to what they have. But in the corner they have a treadle lathe and that's what they used before electricity when it was pre-industrial and they had to use foot power and that's how they did their lathe work. You know? it's, um, it's pretty cool because it still works. It still works. It still works, doesn't it? Okay. So the, the tools they have there, you know, for using on pine wood are good. They are in good shape. There's quite a collection. I recommend it highly to check it out. But um, if you need to have you need to have character. I know I keep on going on this over and over and over again. What's the importance of character, say, to you? What's the importance of character? Personal. It's personal. Yeah. It's your signature. Yeah. You can say when you see it in someone's hand, oh, I made that. Uh, that was seven years ago over at uh, Red Barn. Yeah. In the back. Yeah. On a Saturday. Yeah. Because it really stood out to you or it really burned you or something like that. In 50 years, the blacksmith in a little white dot is the only burn I've ever gotten. So, and so far, so good. <laughs> Knock on wood. Actually, this guy, very special. Uh, this was found in a flea market in Hawaii, on Kauai, the island of Kauai. Um, the guy says, I want 40 bucks. No discussion. The blade was cracked, so I had to replace it. That was expensive. But this thing is essentially a, a roughing plane. It will go through anything you've got, and it'll just cut right through it. But again, it's razor sharp and only put on one side. I'm not quite sure. I think that was mold that made the, the mark here. It got moldy one day. Some kind of a stain that's in there in the wood forever. But it's, um, it's oak. The wood is oak wood. And as you can see, it's given a nice polish mm -hmm. to it by that belt sander. That same belt sander polished the wood as it smoothed it out at the same time. That's pretty convenient, don't you think? Yeah. So this one is, uh, and it's even signed by the guy who made it, his signature in handwriting. You know, the old, um, he used a small chisel and he tapped out the uh, Japanese letters for his name, which is pretty cool. I, I'm glad I was able to refinish and have it work again. Questions? You get a wide blade down there and replace it. Where do you get one? Yeah, get, you have to send away for it. That one caught. Um, well, there was a magazine called the Japan Woodworker a couple years ago, and so you sent away for it and comes back and said, that'll be $250, please. <laughs> okay, all right. It'll last for the next 50 years. Let's see, I'll be 120, I won't care. So it was a, it's a good investment, I think. Any questions? Anybody have any questions? Got to have somebody ask something like, you in the corner there. Anything you want to know about woods or tools? Yeah, you, no? OK. How about the uh, gentleman in the yellow? I think eventually they did, you know, when the electricity came in. But until then, it was steam power for a lot of their work, a lot of band saws. Okay. Um, whatever sanding device they had, I, I can't imagine what they'd use to sand wood back pre-electrical era. But um, yeah, these were band saws. There was this show that came out probably 30 years ago. It's, it's a, uh, a steam-powered workshop, basically, that has been reconditioned from back in the 20s. Every tool that this guy had, 
forge and saw and grinders and drills were all belt driven. So as long as you get those belts going, it really doesn't matter what's their power source. I would imagine for when they started going underground and they needed timber, right. then you're talking about you know either sending away for the wood, which is why if you ever been to anybody been to Lake Tahoe, ever been to Lake Tahoe, notice how all the trees are all the same and they're the same height everywhere. That's because the originals were all cut down for wood to put in mines and mine shafts. Okay. What grew up was the same tree, the same age, and they're all the same height, the same age, the same thickness, because it was all gone. You've seen pictures of the area, it was just scalped, as far as you can see. What was that about? When? Probably gold rush time. Yeah, I'd say so. And they just said it's a useful uh, resource. Cut them all down. So they were essentially wiped out. But then the trees came back. You know? Well, they didn't originally. Until the German engineers came in and did the German box mining. And that's when the trees started leaving. Yeah, more efficient. We're just old miners before that without using, they used the pillar support. Didn't dig everything out and let the pillar. Oh, boy. Yeah, back in the old days, but then you found out that wood was cheap. Uh, wood was cheap. You just had to get it. Wood compressed too, right? Cheaper levels. Well, yeah, but you know, that's why they have good miners back then. They say that there's old miners and there's bold miners, but there's no such thing as old bold miners. <laughs> they don't live that long. Yeah. So. Um, what kind of wood was the trees? That's all pine wood, but it was big. Big bulks, they call it, big chunks. You know? Whether or not they were perfectly smooth with scrapers, I honestly doubt that. You know? But uh, just as long as it held up the, the roof and whatever happened to it afterwards. Isn't it true that there's 100, mine, 100 miles of mines shafts underneath angels? Probably half of them are still being supported by wood structures until they start to fall apart. You know? Don't be at the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, kinds of glues. What kind of glue should you use on wood to hold it together? Hoof glue. In the olden days, it was hoof glue. Nowadays, you can go to uh, Ace Hardware. You can get uh, water-based glues. The water in the glue acts as, um, as a transportation system for the glue particles. It soaks into the wood and then it dehydrates, okay? So it makes the joint harder than the wood itself. You try and break it at the joint, the wood on both sides of the joint breaks, but not the joint itself. So if you have a woodworking project, use um, something three. What's that? Um, it's a certain 3M. Some kind of a 3M product that's water based. Use that. And if you find out that you're using lignum and it has wax in it, you use epoxy. The epoxy is a better grip when it doesn't soak into the, into the, to the wax of the wood. The epoxy has a better grip, just in case you wonder. Yeah. Question? Can you still, can you get this glue still? Because it used to be super hard for the original? Yes. Do you need to do that? You can do that. <laughs> Probably cost you. You know, and I'm sure the horse will not appreciate it, you know? <laughs> but um, it's, uh, it's something you gotta think about. It's important to, to think about. And in fact, we had time for figuring out the door price? Hmm. <laughs> okay, so for door price, here's the question. How much did this cost? So keep that in mind. Just, just think of a number. In your labor or in material? You decide. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. I think we pretty much covered, pretty much covered everything. And my voice is starting to give out too at the same time. Wow. 
Well, you know, keeping that in mind, I'd hate for them to use one of these on me. <laughs> Hold still. <laughs> it's called an amputation saw. Yeah, no well, kidding. Yeah. They are some that oh, that's Or a sternal saw. External like saw. Uh, all right, so. Um, I have another question. Yeah. What type of uh, thing would you use to, to draw work like that? I mean, they taught, have a thing my dad has that's called a horse or something to make shows. Yes, a yeah, draw horse. Yeah. yeah. And in fact, I think they still, I think they still have one down in uh, the mining museum, a draw horse. You would sit on it and you push like this and it, They've got one down at the mining museum. Yeah. yeah. On draw horse. That's a what an excellent question. What a great group you guys are. Yeah. <laughs> my dad used to make my dad my uncle furniture all the time. Oh, okay. All right. Okay, so who who has the highest number? We have high numbers. Okay, hundred seventy five. 725. Keep going. 3550. No, 3550. What was that? Zero. You win. <laughs> it costs nothing. Oh, thank you. Uh, open it up and see. Oh, my. Okay. So it only goes a certain way. See how it's lumpy on this side and it's cut out on that side. So make sure it goes in the other way so it fits that hole. The other way. See, see that? Can you oh, sort of jimmy it? See? Yeah, I've got it. Okay. It's, it's a beautiful painting. You're welcome. So that's about all I can handle talking for almost 45 minutes straight, question wise. What kind of things do you do over at the Red Barn? Um, Fix stuff? Whatever I wish. That's the fun part of it. If you're a docent for a couple hours a month, I say, here are the keys to the annex. Yeah, so I'm also a black farmer. So I make the tools to do the woodworking. And so you become a woodworking blacksmith or a blacksmithing woodworker. <laughs> so I, I tried to conf really concentrate just on the woodworking today. Hmm? A craftsman. I guess. Uh, I'm too modest to agree with you. <laughs> I uh, was a computer draftsman. No, no, no. That's all I did all day long was just this. So to regain my sanity, <laughs> I did this along with taking care of two kids and having a wife and you know, na, 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 so on and so forth. For 50 years, I picked it up in high school, was in metalworking, and then in college, tried to join the two together. Can you marry wood and steel? That's the question. And the, question the answer is, yes, you can. It just takes you 50 years. <laughs> so it's been an interesting 50 years so far, and it's been an interesting lecture. Hope you folks learned something. Uh, I enjoyed having you as an audience, and I think I'm going to hold right there. Thank you very much. <laughs>